Really. Right, well, uh, I'm Ewan Roberts. Um, some of you will know me, some of you won't. Uh, I manage, if that is the correct term, Asylum Link, which is a, a drop-in centre up in, um, in Edge Hill. And those are our aims, but uh, it sort of goes a bit beyond that. What we see ourselves as is a safe space for asylum seekers and refugees to come and meet and to discuss and to relax and have a cup of tea co and coffee and step out of the hurly-burly for a bit. Um, we see between 150 and 160 people a day uh, for all the things that go on at the centre. And that equates at the moment to around about 4,000 people a year, 4,000 individuals, because everybody comes back more than once. And uh, there are other, there's lots and lots of services that hang off that. So you've got the safe space, and then you've got the English classes. There's a guitar workshop, there's a drum workshop, there's clothing you can get at a jumble sale on a Wednesday or free if you're destitute. Uh, there's all sorts of things there. And one guy <coughs> came in one day a wee while ago and he said, I would like you to get me a wife. <laughs> and he said, oh, uh, well, we don't do that. And he said, well, why not? You do everything else. Um, and that's kind of how we've operated in the past. Uh, if we've seen a need for something, we just bolt it on the outside, which makes us a quite a, an odd organisation. Um, I haven't got the visitor numbers there, but those are that top blue line is the caseload. That's the number of people who will come in for something other than a cup of tea or coffee. You know, it's poor housing, it's missing NAS payments, it may be trying to refloat their case. Uh, any number of things, um, so that the current caseload is 700 and odd a year. But out of that, because we're here to talk about well-being, I, I really want to talk about how that relates to the destitute. So there's about 200 and, I'd say, 240 destitute people out of that last figure, because when you get the destitute tick in our place, it stays with you, even though your status changes. So some of those are nice destitute people, that's an odd term, but they've been destitute got status and they've come back in for something like a travel document, uh, which is a nice thing. But every year there's somewhere between 50 and 100 newly destitute people that roll through the system and end up at our door. So we can provide housing for 15, maybe 20 at a stretch if we've got enough hosts, and we can provide food and cash for about 70. So you do the maths and you say, well that's 230, take away 70. So those are other people that we can't provide direct support for. So what are they going to do? Um, a lot of people come in and get casework <coughs> services, so something like Section 4 support. But what else can we do that's meaningful? As uh, Zara and Sam mentioned, they, the Red Cross funds us to do some of this work. The majority of the funding for our housing and our food will come from an organisation called SAS, which is Churches Together on Merseyside, which is rooted through us. We also receive a lot of support from the St Vincent de Paul Society, uh, the, um, a, a certain St Vincent de Paul and Refugee Action have also helped us along the way. And there's churches and there's individuals that donate. So there's a lot goes into the actual delivery of the destitution uh, project other than just us who run it. Uh, I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, but I like this idea of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, when you're talking about destitute people, the, the, there's a temptation to say everybody's down at the bottom and it's all about housing and food and survival. And of course it is in some ways. However, survival's just not the story. That We're human beings, we don't just survive. We need other things. So a lot of what Asylum Link actually does is to provide those other things and well-being is a combination of good physical health and good mental health. And for me, with it, thinking about asylum seekers, it's their mental health that degrades incredibly quickly. So we've got to, we're not just working at that bottom level, we're working with emotional needs and uh, human values and dignity and self-respect and those kind of areas which come further up the the triangle. So it's, it's, it's more complicated than just housing and food. Um, we did a thing uh, years ago now called, well it, it was uh, for CSIP, it was a bit of uh, research into how minority groups accessed mental health services. 
And we use this thing called the PHQ-9, and it's when you go to see the doc, and you go, oh, doctor, I've got a sore foot. And he says, well, how are you sleeping? How are you feeling? And he'll ask, those are the first two questions. How are you sleeping? How are you feeling? If, if, you, tell, if you tell him you're feeling awful and you're not sleeping very well, he'll go on and ask you another couple of questions. Never mind about your bad foot. Um, and the last question they'll ask you is, have you contemplated suicide? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about how you'll do it? So that's the, the PHQ-9. So you can get a PHQ-9 score. And out of a sample of 36 people, 86% were moderate to severe for depression. And some of those were up at the suicide end. So not, not, not all of them were destitute. This is just the ordinary asylum process. This is what it'll do to you the longer you're in it. It actually tears you apart. Um, so what, what do we do to sort of counteract things like that? Um, so for, no, 2008, that's a long time ago now, we embarked on this thing called the Target Wellbeing Programme. We've got lottery funding for it. And along with about another 10 projects in Liverpool, we had a real hard look at well-being and what that meant and what we could do to promote it within this group. Uh, produced this lovely 95-page document which uh, nobody would read, so we turned it into postcards. So you might see the postcards flying about. But there's a couple of copies out there if you want to read it. Uh, you know, maybe can't get to sleep at night or something. Um, but within that, we tried, to, we tried to put specific elements that would um, address the destitution issues. So if you have a look there, the ones in blue, porridge for breakfast, soup for lunch, uh, Friday fruit, which became the Thursday fruit. It doesn't quite rhyme the same. But, um, and the recipe boxes, you know, take it away and cook it yourself. Um, those were things that were designed not to boost people's well-being, but to help them survive. Which was a weird thing to argue, to go back to the lottery and groundwork and all the handlers who were going, why are you doing this? And we're trying to explain that well-being's not just about feeling nice, it's, uh, in this case it's about survival. Uh, the other projects um, that are in yellow there, those were the sort of longer term ones. Those were the ones that uh, brought people together, put them into contact with the, the UK community, allowed them to form friendships and be constructive and do things. The, the, the meals and the, the fruit and stuff, it, they had a similar effect. That you, you, know, you sit down, you don't go into a corner and you know, shove it down. You talk to people, do you, do you like that? And somebody will say, no, that was awful. So why was it awful? You have conversations with people and you, you work things out. Um, strangely enough, that one of the things that the, the destitute guys said when we asked them specifically, said, what is it you need most at Asylum Link? And they said, yeah, even though we come here for food and we can't get it anywhere else, the thing that we really, really like is the social aspect. It's meeting our friends, it's seeing other people. It's meeting new friends. The women who cooked on the, uh, on the Home and Away cooking course, um, they thought that somebody in Heighton showed them how to make chicken pie. And they thought they had got the keys to the kingdom. They came back absolutely full of it. I made a pie, I made a pie. I've never made a pie in my life. And those were destitute people. And it gave them something else, something they could cling on to. Um, we always say you need to make friends. You need to make friends with other asylum seekers, you need to make friends with the volunteers, you need to make friends with people outside the centre. Because when it all goes pear-shaped, your friends are the only thing you've got left. You know, very few other organisations are going to help you out there. I can't tell you how many destitute people there are floating about in Britain, how many destitute asylum seekers, because nobody keeps count of them. We have thousands. Oh, no, we are a thousand. We've got pr probably about a thousand in the database since we start since we started ten years ago, and I couldn't tell you where ninety percent of them are. They're gone, um, but they're not forgotten. Um, and the, f the thing about friends, it's crucial because it, at current rates, two out of every three asylum seekers are refused. It was uh, three out of four, um, and it'll probably go back to three out of four. So it's vital that people make friends. Going back to Maslow, that sort of the dignity, the respect, hey, if you ever want to get to self-actualization, that's brilliant, but um, it's a tough, tough old ask in this neck of the woods. Um, 
but sharing, sharing and interacting, uh, <coughs> taking the time to say hello to somebody, to say good morning to somebody, to greet them properly. It takes longer in the morning, especially in our place, because there's about 100 people, you've got to go, good morning, how are you? But people appreciate it. And so to, to have, to, if we were running a project that was kind of soulless, uh, um, say the food store, if you just came to the food store and the door opened and somebody handed you a bag of food and you went, okay, thank you very much, and next, then that's, that would almost make the problem worse. The people who come to the food store, they see Judith and Barbara and uh, Claire every week and they talk about what's happened in the past week. And the, uh, the food store is not something where you just get a package and it's given out to you. You go in and you pick and you choose. You say, well, I'd, I'd like that this week. Can I have that this week? Yeah, fine. It's more, it's more like a shop. Um, strangely enough, uh, with the clothing, we used, we used to give away clothing for free. And when the times got hard, uh, we had to concentrate on the recycling. So we said, destitute people can still get free clothing, but everybody else who's supported comes to the jumble sale on a Wednesday. And we thought, well, what, how, how evil is that now? <laughs> now we're charging asylum seekers for clothes. <laughs> uh, um, but in fact, it made things better. Because people didn't grab and hoard and put in bags. Um, there wasn't always this rush to get down the clothes store first thing in the morning. And there was something more dignified about paying a small amount of money, 50p for a duvet or something like that. And it, there was a more of a human exchange going on. And people seem happier with it. I know um, a lot of our volunteers are happier with it. But it's good to include people in things to make them part of something. Um, and so we've got a, a large number of volunteers that are from asylum backgrounds. <laughs> um, it's difficult working with asylum seeker volunteers because their lives are so uncertain. But we just we have to allow for that. Uh, you have to allow for not being able to get a CRB check for somebody, but you find ways of working around it. And the friendly face. Um, for those of you who know Sister Kathleen, uh, she's <laughs> she's a bit of a legend, um, and people come to see Sister Kathleen for casework, and she solves their problems, but she doesn't only do that. Um, people come to see Kathleen because it's Kathleen and they want to sit next to her and they want her to hold her hand and look into their eyes and tell them it will be okay. They need that wee lift and so being friendly and outgoing and allowing people to come into your life a wee bit um, it helps in so many other ways. So projects like like the ones that Asylum Link run, they are quite scatological, they're seemingly quite chaotic. <laughs> we took, uh, we'd, we'd, hired, we'd got a bus for the Refugee Week trip out to Bidston Farm last Wednesday, and we'd calculated that we would get 70, 65, 70 people, and we ended up with 110. And <laughs> we, had, we had the minibus, we had six cars and the double-decker, and we had to buy more food when we were out there. It was only, it was only over the water to Bidston. Um, and I think we left a the guy there, you know. <laughs> 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 he, came, he came back in, he said to somebody this morning, you left me there, you know. And uh, uh, she said, you, you're joking? He said, no, I'm not. I, d I still think he is joking. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it's, that, it's not, you know, there's, there's lots of rough edges around it. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But it's, it's very human. Um, and it, it seems to work. People enjoy it. Uh, my destitution manager, Sarah, uh, she always says, you can't work in a paint factory and not get splashed. And I think that's actually what happens to us. We begin eventually to reflect some of the chaos <laughs> that our service users uh, come in with. Um, I suppose to finish off, really, um, it is, it's the small things. There's one person that we housed for years and years and we fed her and we clothed her and she never ever said thank you except the day she was deported and she phoned she managed to phone before she was gone on the plane 
She didn't say thank you for all the help. She said thank you for phoning me when I was in detention. And I, th I guess that's the measure of how important that human contact is. Um, it's actually quite a nice story because I got a phone call from her uh, about two months ago and she's now in Canada. She made it out and she made it back and it took her five years for leaving the UK and going back to where she was going and she's now a recognised refugee in Canada, which is fantastic. But um, I suppose uh, you might have heard this before, but uh, to quote Gandalf the Grey, uh, I found it is the small everyday needs of ordinary folk that keep the darkness at bay. And when we're thinking about asylum seekers and well-being, I think we should all keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs>